Thank you. It's excellent to be here. Oh, I just Sanders noticed, Smith. though. I don't know. Uh, is my mic picking up? You guys hear that okay? Excellent. Yeah, thank you all. I really appreciate it. It's excellent to be here. <clears throat> yeah, I'm very grateful. Um, yeah, what can I say? ZBrush has been incredible in my career. It's uh, unlocked the doors to many opportunities across a variety of industries over the last decade. I've had a lot of great mentors along the way, too, uh, many of which who I got to uh, catch up with this morning, which has been excellent. Um, and they've been very generous with their time and their knowledge with me over the years. So I'm hoping I can pay just a bit of that forward to you all here today and uh, share some ideas and some workflows that can help you take your ZBrush to the next level, help you bulletproof your future as a digital artist, and hopefully help you become the very best artist that you all know that you can be. <clears throat> so yeah, let's dive in. Um, this is a condensed version of what I usually share with my students and mentees. Uh, so it's really excellent that we have uh, so many high school students joining us today. Um, yeah, just to give some idea on where uh, ZBrush can take you, give you a sense of what a full project on a job might look like all the way from A to Z. So yeah, I'll share uh, three workflows with you and some ideas on current and future uses for ZBrush uh, as a presentation for the first part. And then I'll share a project that I'm currently working on as a live ZBrush demo for the second half. Uh, and yeah, that's where uh, Louis can come bail me out when I get stuck in ZBrush 23. Oh, I'm, here we uh, go. Very rusty at the moment. Here <laughs> we go. We know he's been training hard for this event. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> since we're here at the Noman School of Visual Effects in the heart of Hollywood, I thought I'd start by sharing some workflows that I use in film and television to start. So these workflows utilize ZBrush from blue sky pre-production sketching all the way to the beginning stages of production. The idea being that when you're looking to invest time and money into learning new software, you're looking for a single package that can handle as many parts of a production as possible. As much of an all-in-one package as possible for as much of the pipeline as possible. And this is what I mean when I say foundational in your skill set. The software sets the foundation for an entire workflow and enables as many paths forward through the production as possible. It provides versatility and diversity of workflow. <clears throat> To illustrate this, I'd love to share with you a workflow that I used on back in 2017, 2018 for American Horror Story Apocalypse. And of course, I still use this workflow and uh, many workflows uh, similar to it uh, on TV and film jobs to this day. So I worked under costume designer Lou Eirich to create costume pieces from thumbnail sketch to final illustration and also to sculpt and model the final pieces as, th as 3D printed props worn by the actors. <clears throat> One of the hero costume designs I worked on was this uh, dystopian, futuristic version of a plague doctor. So we have this solid foundation to start from design-wise, since the plague doctor has so much historical context. We were searching for an update to the design, something that was true to the original, yet future-facing, apocalyptic. And so here's where we started. Uh, this is just a handful of our rough sketches you can see up here on the left. <clears throat> we partnered uh, ZBrush with Photoshop for some extra punch in this case, and uh, Photoshop primarily to paint and, and photo bash the uh, cloth pieces in. And then ZBrush really where the magic happens. Uh, we use that to uh, block in the masks using primitive shapes to block in the form language before painting over. Uh, because we knew from the start that we wanted the mask to be very custom and 3D printing was a likely potential option. So of course I left at the chance and got straight into ZBrush. <clears throat> And you can see here, these are some early lighting tests we did. Um, what's very cool about this is that um, originally how the script writers had seen this kind of mask, um, you know, they didn't know that it was gonna be transparent. That was an idea we had to make it uh, more uh, futuristic. And so they worried that if it was transparent, they wouldn't have this nice reveal moment, you know, when the uh, actor takes it off at the beginning. And when they saw this transparent mask, they loved it, like I said, but uh, they thought they'd lose that moment. But because we were already in 3D, I was able to quickly do these lighting tests and um, basically show them that if you, you know, cast this kind of slice of light over the uh, top planes of the mask, um, that you could still kind of get that obscuration of the uh, character underneath and still get that moment that they were looking for. So right out the gate, ZBrush being very powerful in a 3D workflow, even though we're at, you know, the concept art stage. So more refinement of the mask once that direction was approved and we got the uh, entire production on board. You can see how uh, 3D also gives production more confidence when going into 3D printing as well. Um, at any time along the way, I can send this over to the props so they can start test printing to fit on actors, trying out materials to finish, things like that. Um, so being able to do that even at that early stage of production, very, very powerful. Um, 
Yeah, the final design, it turned out to be pretty simplistic, just like it's uh, Leather Origins. We really, if you saw those sketches to, uh, that we started with, uh, always started like with, uh, you know, much more designy kind of takes on it. But we really start stripping everything, uh, everything away, got into the uh, basics here. And so it's really just these two elements that make up the mask, um, starting from simple primitives for these secondary shapes. Um, and then using uh, Z Modeler to give detail to the primitives, keeping them clean and watertight, uh, keeping the geometry flowing uh, as we went. Um, that way it's you know, easy to share with other artists, easy to render, easy to print. <clears throat> and then for the transparent piece, uh, basically just a, a traditional sculpture workflow, uh, using all the sculpture brushes that come preloaded into ZBrush uh, to get the shape down, and then Z Remesher to clean the topology and bring the final model together. And here's our final approved model. Uh, we did one last batch of renders to look at how the landmarks of the mask line up with landmarks of the actor's face, uh, showing off the piece from various camera angles before sending the props for final 3D printing. Uh, basically, they just wanted to make sure that you know, all the uh, landmarks of the human face lined up really nicely with the landmarks of the mask. We checked out a couple other camera angles with that. And then our final costume illustration on the right here, uh, reflecting the opening scene in this post-apocalyptic wasteland uh, with photo bashing of various cloth pieces photographed by the costume department. And then 3D renders of the mask with a bit of paint over in Photoshop for that atmosphere so that the sketch has a bit of that story beat. And then boom, we get our final approval. Yeah, so we have this successful pipeline, ZBrush from sketch to that final prop on screen. And then finally, at the very end, production asked for a one last sketch to visualize one of the lead, the lead actresses in the mask, uh, just for that final leap of confidence when going into shooting. Uh, and then here's one of the opening shots uh, on the right here. Uh, this is actually a, a beat from the show. And uh, yeah, I particularly love this one because it's, uh, it's hitting all those lighting notes that we started off at the very beginning with, uh, that we had envisioned from that first lighting test during the concept art phase. Yeah, the character enters the scene mysteriously and uh, savors that reveal by using the lighting very effectively. So very, very rewarding for that workflow. <clears throat> and then, yeah, here's our, uh, our dudes in action out doing whatever dystopian plague doctors do. Another final, final shot from the show. Yeah, this was an incredible experience being able to use ZBrush on so much of a production and have the results be so direct with that final product. <clears throat> so huge shout out to the costume department on that. This was an excellent time and shows just how far one strategic piece of software can take you. <clears throat> By the way, you never asked if uh, I was going to take questions throughout. <laughs> this guy's keeping me honest. Do you want to take the questions during or after? Definitely during, yeah. If we Definitely can keep during. it organic. you know, I want to turn like the dial up. Yeah, well, uh, like I said, I'll show a few different work workflows. So uh, at any point in time, you guys are curious about anything, happy to answer things. You want to talk about the plague doctors or anything at all? Now is your time. No, I'm kidding. Yes, yeah, here, we already got. Hey, now we'll see what we've done here. Hey, what's up? I like your hat. Thank you very much. Uh, with the plague doctor, was the clear mask, how was that done? Was that 3D printed or? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so my understanding, I mean, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of pre-production, so I don't exactly know what happens when I pass off assets, but um, my understanding of it was that uh, we built one kind of base shape. We had a couple others that were customized to different actors, um, so we had just like um, uh, a couple different measurements for it. And then those are printed and then cast as a mold, and then that mold is what they're you know, filling with the, uh, the final, uh, whatever material it is that gets that transparent look, yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, thanks for the question. Anybody else? Take advantage. These guys are here live. Here, there's another one over here, stage left. Hang on a second. It's all good. We'll do uh, Godzilla next. <clears throat> Just one second, Xander. I got one for you. Yeah, please. Were, you, were you all influenced by the, the real history of, like, the, the medieval times of the plague when they put the herbs and stuff in their masks and made them extra long, the beaks? Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, a huge like part of all of this is research. Um, so yeah, uh, working with uh, Lou Eirich, like we had, you know, all these like um, uh, history of medieval Europe and things like that with like, you know, those um, uh, like etched drawings of like plague doctors and things like that. So we were pulling very heavily from that. Um, trying to mix that in with like modern day hazmat suits, um, that sort of thing. And then like I said, um, you know, those original sketches I showed, I had all these, you know, details all over the place. Um, but if you go back to that very original uh, Plague Doctor mask, it's very, very simple. And so we really tried to maintain that simplicity through the design. Yeah. Hopefully that got your question. I think so. Well said. 
Cool, good deal. So yeah, uh, another one of my favorite examples from my career. Um, I was fortunate enough uh, to work on Godzilla vs. Kong back in uh, 2017. So yeah, I was contacted by Studio ADI under the art direction of the legendary Tom Woodruff uh, to design a, a secondary creature for the film. Uh, so this time I'm sketching everything in ZBrush and I know that I'll be delivering a rough sculpture or a 3D, a 3D maquette to the VFX team directly. <clears throat> So these are the uh, ZBrush thumbnail sketches or speed sculpts where we arrived after the first couple days of designing. Um, so a bit about the process here. Uh, because we're looking to be more efficient than napkin sketching, and we already have a decent grasp on the kind of creature we want to sculpt, uh, we want to be able to design from all angles immediately, hence why we're in ZBrush from the get-go. And I'm using a combination of uh, Dynamesh sphere sculpting in this case, um, using you know, all the standard brush tools. Um, I have, I have a, a nice uh, library of alphas and uh, textures, you know, photography I've done over the years that I'll convert into alphas to use in ZBrush. So I had this whole nice rock library and able to quickly drag out some alphas on the surface and start getting some grit in there, you know, start uh, figuring out where this creature's from. Um, and then the other big one is obviously the, the actual uh, anatomical pieces. And this is basically, you know, because we're trying to move fast, uh, this is just some Frankensteining, Frankensteining with the anatomy model that comes preloaded into ZBrush. Brush. So kind of just pulling those limbs off and moving them around, just starting with some uh, grit to the canvas, so to speak. So yeah, with uh, live feedback from the art director, we quickly refine the design and can immediately use it to try some camera angles and some lighting tests. Uh, we did some key shot renders for effect, which you can see here on the left, uh, just to start visualizing him in photoreal lighting. <clears throat> and after a couple weeks of revision and refinement, here's where we took that final sculpture. So, like I said, this is after constant refinement of the sculpture. Uh, instead of iterations, like a more traditional concept art workflow, uh, we continue to build and clay directly onto the design. So uh, keeping each part or each appendage as its own separate subtool is so that we have ultimate flexibility of the, of the design and so that we can set the pivot joint of each. This is super important uh, for something like this. Um, so basically we could do these mini animation tests on the fly so that we can get a sense of its movement and locomotion early on because uh, <laughs> Let's be real here, the uh, leg design is just a bit fantastical, especially uh, <laughs> this little area right here. Uh, but yeah, we got it to work and the final animations turned out really excellent. So huge, huge shout out to the animation department on that team, absolutely nice. rocked it. <clears throat> yeah, so another huge advantage was being able to send over the sculpt to the modeling and animation teams ahead of time. So basically they can be working with assets uh, while we're still kind of designing and we can kind of inform both departments that way. Um, so yeah, very valuable workflow. So while they were doing those tests, uh, we actually went back to concept and I started doing some paint over to try out some uh, different color palettes and textures and even try out a couple other ideas that production thought of along the way. Um, yeah, at some point the producers wanted to try out this kind of <laughs> diamond encrusted version. I think it was kind of uh, an homage to like, uh, you know, Godzilla from the 80s, or like the diamonds on the back. Um, so yeah, we were able to easily render out our current sculpture, do some paint and photo bash on top to test out their ideas. They hit us with a bunch of crazy ideas, but this is the only one I thought I should share. Uh, but ultimately this one became our final concept and I used it to do a quick first pass at poly paint and ZBrush for the texture artists. Uh, so they had some color and some brush stroke strokes to start from instead of just raw digital clay. So yeah, this was the, uh, the final model passed off. <clears throat> And then our final sculpture here, delivering both the T-pose mesh with clean subdivisions and topology as both a base for the animators and the final sculptors and modelers. As well as sending this pose version uh, over here uh, for movement reference. And uh, this guy here was actually a result of one of those mini animation tests we did where we posed him uh, kind of doing a lunge or a twist, you know, uh, as he uh, jumps from a cavern, something like that. Uh, but was, what was really cool about this is uh, it also gives us the ability to start prep for a 3D print of the sculpture, um, which could be used as a live maquette for production and printed as a showpiece for the studio. Um, ultimately, though, it was decided it wasn't worth the budget. So you can see it's basically unfinished. It's not a watertight print-ready mesh. Um, but what's really nice in a workflow like this is that not only are we you know, tackling the design, having an asset that we can be passing off, um, but at any point along the way, we can definitely take something like this and 3D print it as well. So kind of tackling all these areas of production all at the same time. <clears throat> 
And then I always really liked this top view. Um, this is what looked really cool. Um, in the film, they're kind of in this like center earth area and all the actors you know, look up at the sky above and you're actually seeing the crust of the earth. Um, and you'd see these guys crawling through the rocks from below and you'd get a view like this. Yeah, but I loved how the final scene turned out. Uh, one, of these, one of these guys pops out of the ground and gets stomped by Kong and uh, instantly killed. So definitely a career highlight for me. Um, you can really see how true the design is to the concept sculpt. Uh, everything from the anatomy detail, the movement, even down to the placement of the rocks on the carapace. Uh, so yeah, very rewarding to see our design to come to life and be so true to that original concept. That's the power of 3D and a concept workflow. Yeah, again, ZBrush being powerful from sketch to screen. Well said. Mm -hmm. Let's clap for a minute here. This is looking good. <laughs> a little louder. Thank you all. Any questions? Yeah, we got some questions in the front row. Hey, what's up? Hi, guys. So, I'd like to ask, how far do you go with the sculpture? And what kind of details you put after that in the photo washing step? Mm. How far do you go in, in the sculpt? Definitely. I mean... It really depends on the production, um, especially like in television, like with the American Horror stuff, we're moving at lightning speed. So really it's like how much I can get in there, you know, as possible. Um, for something like this, uh, for a film, we typically do have some more time uh, on a piece. Uh, and I'll kind of, yeah, so you can see it's not terribly far. Like it's hard for me to consider this a sculpture. This is more a concept sculpt or a speed sculpt. Um, so, yeah, I'm trying to think. It, man, it just really depends on that, uh, on that production. But I would say, like, as long as kind of everything is addressed, you know, there's some things that every department that's going to be looking at this has enough where they understand what's going on, then I feel like the job is done, and that's as far as, you know, it needs to be taken. Um, but then, obviously, you know, I'm kind of more in the pre-production concept stage, but there's going to be a whole other team of artists who, you know, will take a sculpt like this and, you know, do a whole you know, second uh, uh, sculpting pass so that it really gets that photorealism. Um, you know, this right here, this sculpture is way more photoreal than the sculpt I passed off to them. So there's still a huge gap in, uh, in quality uh, there. But I think uh, ideally, and where I think this whole workflow is going is that at the concept stage, you will be building something that is absolutely photoreal. And I definitely think that for artists that want to be working in, uh, um, you know, photoreal mediums, that's what you should be aiming for. Absolutely. That's well said. There's another question up front here. Howdy. Um, <clears throat> you briefly uh, touched on the rather unique uh, order of the appendages there. Do you mind just elaborate for just a second on that, the, that design decision? Because it inherently brings a lot of challenges to it as well. But 100%. Um, yeah, it is a weird design decision. Um, I like it. But I think that was, that was actually my art director, uh, Tom Woodruff, I think. So basically, for those of you who know Studio ADI, they've been doing like uh, practical monster effects for films for like probably three or more decades. Um, something tells me he had just seen every potential possibility for legs and monsters and crabs so far. And he was really like, we have to try something different for it. And he's like, let's try overlapping them. And I was like, all right, let's, let's, let's do it. So I, I'm fairly certain that's where that came from. Um, Would you say it was handled in a modular way, like muscular-wise, like from a musculature standpoint? You just handle like one piece of it and put it over? Or are you trying to just sculpt it with using Dynamish? Sorry, how do you mean for the, uh, the appendages? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. in concert with that. Is that like something you would handle? segment wise or would you would you just go at it like one piece at a time like dynamish mm, yeah um for this case because we were starting with the you know just the human anatomy model in zbrush uh you know it's all one sub tool so what's really nice is you can split that into individual pieces but if i remember correctly i think i just took a human leg bent it backwards and kind of just sculpted it straight onto that anatomy and then later on, you know, each of these pieces is its own subtool. Like I said, that way we can set the joints and play with it and that's what you know, watch yeah. that live. Yeah. Perfect. And so they have their own poly groups and all that jazz. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Try that's a good workflow. I think that uh, yeah, way in the back I'm coming. Hey. What's going on? You take that. 
So my question is, when you moved around like the limbs to make it look more like a monster, like how do you establish the movement so that it still looks normal? Like you would, like you can still understand how it would move. Because like, do you take it in the sense like, since it looks like a crab, do you think of it at the sense? Like, do you still try to establish that movement, or do you try to bend it differently so that it still works? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the things I love about, you know, being in ZBrush for concept art is uh, that you can kind of do all those tests uh, right away and really get an idea of what that locomotion would be in real time. Um, not to say that, you know, very talented 2D artists can't do something similar, but you just can't beat kind of replicating that uh, animation from the get-go. Um, it's funny you said crab, too, because on the, the very first versions of this, we were thinking about him having like a back-and-forth movement, but ultimately I think uh, it just wasn't very cinematic <laughs> to have like a crab. So, you know, we added the tail and we tried like more like weighting him, uh, you know, as a, uh, you know, like a, um, a, uh, a quadrupedal creature. Um, but yeah, we're doing all those tests along the way and that's uh, really some of the, the magic of using this in a concept workflow. Yeah, that's great. We got another one back here. I think before we go that, it's, it's really important to push things also like to the limit and see if they can move, you know, uh, Absolutely. at an extreme level and what they look like. So here in the back, we got another question. Nice shirt. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was curious about how you posed it with the binding. Did you use the Z-spheres to move the legs around, or did you use Z-spheres to build the actual cage? Yeah, good question. I am not that technical. Um, no, I, uh, I've had a few mentors who actually do uh, that Z-sphere workflow at the beginning. Um, you can treat it like a rig. Um, I would say the only reason we didn't go for something more technical on this was really just time constraints. Um, cause I, I actually, it's funny you bring that up cause I did want to do more of like a rigging workflow cause I knew that testing that animation from the get go was going to be not only a huge selling point as to why to, you know, hire me as the artist on this. Um, but just knowing, uh, what type of scrutiny was going to be on this at the very end of the production or at the very end of the pre-production of the film. Um, yeah, so definitely I recommend that Z-Sphere workflow. Uh, I just did not use that myself. That's really cool. Yeah, you can use that, you can bind it. You can bind the mesh, move it around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really fun. Definitely, yeah. thank you guys. Yeah, great <clears throat> questions. Keep them coming. Yeah, good deal, yeah. Yeah, super gratifying to see this guy jump. I had no idea they were gonna kill him on screen. It looks really great, great, by the way. Let's pause for it, don't rush through that. Like, take a look, make some noise for this guy. This is amazing. <laughs> That's totally cool. Look at that. It's like sushi gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it said in the Big script. Point. No, Big seriously, point. thank you guys. I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. This is very cool. It's a pleasure. <clears throat> All right, so uh, yeah, next. Um, like I said, uh, this is like a condensed version of what I share with uh, my students and mentees. So yeah, next uh, I typically share just a bit about the industries that I've been able to use ZBrush in and uh, where I see ZBrush going in the future. Uh, just so that you all can get uh, do some brainstorming and think of new and exciting ways that you can use the software in your own careers because truly the possibilities are endless for software like this. So, of course, my very favorite is using ZBrush for workflows in film and television, mainly costume, character, and, of course, creature, like you saw. Uh, but I've also used it in other industries, too, like uh, games, digital fashion, Web3, collectibles, prototyping, illustration, advertising, digital humans, and even some AI model training recently. <clears throat> <coughs> And I also know artists who use it for the uh, second half of VFX production, which we talked a little bit about just a second ago. Uh, ZBrush being used here mainly for final sculpt and modeling, texturing and look development. Uh, believe it or not, I also know artists who use it for animation. I know artists who use it in architecture, jewelry, dental, paleontology. Paleontology is a really cool and I hope I get to do that with my career one day. Uh, manufacturing, education, and I'm sure we can all think of a lot more. <clears throat> And then here are just a couple other ideas for industries that I think will become huge over the next decade or so that I think ZBrush can play a very interesting role in. And these are some industries that I kind of have my eyesights on currently. So um, real-time VFX or character animation and AR is a cool one. So <clears throat> yeah, think about facial filters now, like Snapchat filters. Um, the quality is rapidly improving, and I don't think it will be long before the average artist <clears throat> can train a model on a photo real 3D character 
and do complete real-time character animation. So imagine what this is going to mean for independent film creators. Uh, the bar for AAA production continuously lowers, and more and more small teams of individuals will have access to the creation of impressive character FX. And ZBrush, of course, will be excellent. Will, will be an excellent tool in this pipeline, uh, especially in any character workflow, because we will be able to do things that can be done with makeup, or it can't. Sorry. It will be able to do things that can't be done with makeup effects or garments. And obviously, when you combine all three, it uh, just becomes insanely powerful. <clears throat> uh, next, uh, experiential. So this is super broad, and it covers everything from theme parks to VR right now. But uh, I think, ultimately, this will give birth to new mediums that will start to emerge at the end of the decade. Basically, as a way just to envision it here, um, where television and games combine in VR, where you're inside the action and interacting with the story in real time as it's unfolding. And obviously, 3D worlds will require a ton of customization and building, and ZBrush is a great builder. <clears throat> Uh, the creator economy. Uh, I'm sure we're all kind of part of this already, um, but this is really just the idea that the barrier to entry for 3D creation continues to lower, and more and more people want to create their own work as a form of entertainment instead of just consuming it. So if you're one of the artists that builds the assets these future creators will use uh, in their workflows, you will have a place in the future creator economy. And then last, um, this is more of a paradigm than an industry, uh, but something I like to think about um, so think about it like this. Uh, before the 1900s, uh, painters strived for realism, uh, many even using mirrors to project onto their canvases to trace. But as photography became more mainstream, it pushed artists to keep expanding into territory that no one had seen before, like expressionism, cubism, fauvism, dadaism. That's where all this comes from. Uh, it's from artists being squeezed by new technology. Uh, and I think we'll see exactly the same thing with artificial intelligence. Artists pushing to continue expanding into new territories and visuals we have yet to see. And I can't wait to see how ZBrush artists approach completely new styles in the future. So yeah, this, um, this is a great way to evaluate something before investing time or money into learning it and seeing if there's potential for it to become foundational to your skill set. This way of thinking seriously helped me in my career, especially given just how many software packages and skills there are out there that we all have to parse through. And uh, yeah, I, I remember when I was a student here at uh, Noman myself over a decade ago, I remember coming to the first ever ZBrush Summit, which is kind of a trip. And uh, I was asking myself, is ZBrush even going to be relevant in 10 years? <laughs> this software that we're all investing hundreds of hours into. And uh, yeah, for that matter, would digital artists even be relevant in 10 years? <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I was asking the serious questions. Uh, I'm sure all these questions are weighing even more heavily on all of you nowadays uh, with our current technological revolution underway and the current turbulence of our entertainment industries right now. But needless to say, my existential dread was unfounded. ZBrush has paid off brilliantly and I think has every reason to continue to go strong for another decade and more. Yeah, if you work hard and invest yourself into foundational software packages like ZBrush, you will have a place in the future of entertainment. Absolutely. Oh, don't worry, I got more. <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah. So yeah, last, uh, oh no, please, oh, no, yeah. Carry on. Let's do some questions, huh? Yeah, some questions? Be a good spot to leave off for some. Anybody got some questions? Yes, there's a question right here. Yay. Thank you. First of all, wonderful artworks. Very impressed. Thank Second, you very much. You man. mentioned the AI used in the future of artists, and being an artist, uh, being an artist, I understand <laughs> the influence of AI from director's standpoint and from production standpoint. But what's your take on AI as an artist? Mm, absolutely. Louis, I knew I was going to get hit with the AI question. Oh, it's today. no problem. We can have a discussion on it. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, it's controversial. Uh, I mainly want to keep it to ZBrush, but uh, you know, it has done damage to our industries, especially myself as a concept artist. I know that this is the case. Um, but I also think that it has incredible ability to make us wildly more productive and more imaginative. And uh, I know that we're going through kind of a squeeze at the moment uh, with this technology, but I think that it also has the capability of making us all wildly more productive. Um, so yeah, I understand it has some bads right now, but I'm very focused on the goods that it's going to do and uh, how it's going to keep expanding us into this uh, next creative renaissance that we're going to go through. 
And definitely human artists are gonna be a huge part of it, absolutely. That's <laughs> Thank you, you, You got a thumbs up there, and a question way in the back. Yeah. Let me get to you. Yeah, please. Hit. Deep into the bowels of the green screen <laughs> hangar. What would you say is your favorite part about using ZBrush? Oh, man, all of it. <laughs> um, man, uh, I've probably used ZBrush, man, almost every single day for the past decade. Uh, it'd be hard for me to say, like, what's my favorite? Um, you know, I'm going to talk a bit about this with this alien god piece, but, like, I love just starting with a Dynamesh sphere. No reference, no imagery, just a monster energy drink. Don't ever drink this. It's terrible for you. <laughs> That's a pretty slick plug right there. When do you get your shares? Uh, yeah, plug, and then I immediately take it away. Um, and just sculpt. Like, I just, you know, whatever comes, pops into my head, whatever's happening at the moment, like, it's just so freeing. ZBrush is just so intuitive. You can use it way faster than, you know, traditional clay and get to the ideas that you want. Um, highly recommend it, you know, from everyone who's, you know, just starting out to, uh, you know, uh, veterans. Just start with a Dynamosphere and enjoy, seriously. There's a question coming in online. I had, awesome. to, I had to weed through a lot of stuff here. Give me a second. Um, to Xander from Rhiannon Sullivan. Hey. What's your advice for artists that don't want to use AI? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't. You're going to be brilliant. Straight. Yeah, you're going to be brilliant with or without it. You know, if it makes sense to adapt that into your portfolio, go for it. Absolutely. Um, try to use it ethically. Um, for those of you interested in hearing more about that, we could definitely talk afterwards. But uh, yeah, no, there's so much that you can be doing where you don't need artificial intelligence at all, or in the least bit, use it to automate the boring processes. Like, when are we gonna get some uh, AI uh, uh, UVing? Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, it's funny because uh, we're seeing like a contraction in various industries and I'm seeing others absolutely blow up uh, that don't require AI at all. I mean, there's uh, more creative opportunity in the world than ever before in human history. It might, might not feel that way at the moment, but uh, you don't need AI for that. You can be absolutely brilliant without it. Absolutely. Yeah, there was once a time when there were no electric guitars or no electric guitar pedals. And, and we were creating them. People still play at acoustic guitars and... <laughs> Exactly. And the world exactly. isn't burning. They, um, I think they wanted like some advice, though. Yes, we did them dirty on that one. Yeah, they're a little blowing bit. up in the DMs. We did them dirty. I can see it already. Let's go back. Well, hopefully, if they're if they're watching a lot, you know, shoot me a DM. We could definitely be happy to have this conversation more with you and talk more about your specific circumstance. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think generically, really, the advice is. Take a look, like zoom out, take a look at what AI is good at, what it's doing, figure out what it's not doing, and head there. Build the skills that AI is never going to be able to touch you on. Yeah, that's what I'll say. Hopefully that's a bit better. Yeah, I think that's fair. Okay, you can clap for that. Thank you. <laughs> and also, all these things are just tools. I'm going to sound like the, you know, a thousand-year-old vampire in the room saying this to you. They're just tools. They come up and they, they, they come up and you use them for what you want to do. And it's yeah. all about your own personal expression. It's not really anything about anything about anything other than that, really. I definitely agree. I mean, I understand it's not like any other tool. Um, I do feel a little bad comparing it to like photography because it's not that. It's way different. The world's never seen anything like this. But I think generically, yeah, I do agree with you. If you are going to use it. Don't let it use you. You need to use it. Yeah. Art directed. Yeah. Like I said, again, with the guitar pedals, like, yeah. it's just sitting there. I have to step on it. I have to do something, and it does what, I, exactly. what I've done. Exactly. Music's not going to come out without you. It's a great sort of parallel. Okay, let's get into this business here with these alien gods. <laughs> Half there, right? Go deep diving into this rabbit hole. <clears throat> oh, also, Rhiannon said thanks. That was a good answer. Awesome, awesome. So yeah, last I thought I'd share some uh, ideas on uh, personal projects for your portfolio. Um, for me, I try to do a couple personal projects a year. Always recommend personal pieces when in between projects as well, uh, especially when you notice your skills uh, tend to get rusty. Um, and I recommend trying to do them with intention. So for me, I try to practice something useful, trying new workflows while strengthening current ones, while trying to bring a unique visual to life to broaden my portfolio and job prospects in fields that I'm passionate about. That's how I try to start personal projects. So this one is a favorite of mine. This was a collab with my good friend, David Massan, uh, that we worked on back in 2021. We tried different approaches to the same script for a pitch because we were doing a lot of pitching that year. 
And uh, my main focus here was creating a unique character with qualities both human and creature for both my concept art and sculpture portfolios. So here's where, we, uh, here's where I started. <clears throat> so one of my big goals on this was practicing my anatomy. Uh, yeah, I was getting very rusty at the time. So I used scans from 3D Scan Store, and I did master studies of the hands, bodies, and legs. So basically, you know, having the, uh, the, the digital scan from 3D Scan Store up in ZBrush, and then me starting from a Dynamesh sphere and trying to replicate what I saw. Um, and then having more, some more conceptual fun, sculpting from my imagination, designing for the face, headdress, wings, and body adornments. So that's like I'd mentioned a second ago, just no reference, Dynamesh sphere, complete imagination. So, so yeah, focus on pushing my sculpting skills, both technically and conceptually, and trying new workflows between ZBrush, Photoshop, and Keyshot for the final renders to try to set a new pace and a new standard for a concept pitch package. So yeah, these are sketches using my anatomy studies, which I combine all into one uh, Dynamesh form. So yeah, just pushing and pulling forms, uh, you know, move brush, just 70% of the work on any project, uh, you know, H polish, damn standard, clay buildup. Uh, for those of you who are just starting ZBrush, these are just brush tools that come preloaded into ZBrush. You could do, you know, basically anything with. Um, yeah, and then uh, rendering out uh, various material uh, studies and doing some paint over in Photoshop on top of the rough sculpture. So these are just a couple, you know, kind of design explorations we were going on. We were bouncing ideas back and forth and trying crazy things. And then this was uh, my friend David's approach. This is all his work. Um, he's one of my absolute favorite working concept artists today. Absolutely brilliant. Um, so he's uh, using painting much more heavily to find the design in the beginning, uh, more of a traditional 2D concept workflow, laying the foundation uh, for that, or laying the foundation in 2D, uh, and then returning to ZBrush for that refinement. Uh, and you can see the final design here and how far David took it. Yeah, it's just stunningly beautiful and horrifying, and yeah, I think Giger would be proud of this one. <clears throat> And then here's where I took the sculpture. So just some raw views in, uh, in ZBrush. <clears throat> so yeah, like I said, uh, combining all my anatomy studies into one Dynamesh and continuously refining, uh, trying to find that balance between alien and uh, you know, elegant human. Uh, basically using a hair card workflow to create the uh, headpiece or hair. So just starting off with uh, strips of uh, polygons and positioning them one by one until I kind of had the flow that I was looking for. Uh, detailing, detailing, detailing all over the place. Um, trying to create my own alphas and things like that, but most of this is hand sculpted. Um, and then kind of the big one for this is basically uh, duplicating that body mesh. And then what I do, um, this is a really cool workflow that I get asked about a lot um, when I kind of have a, a piece that's like two different materials, but those two materials need to interact with each other. So in this case, it's you know the skin of her body and then all of these gold elements, right? So not to get too technical uh, just yet, but uh, I'll take her skin body, I'll duplicate it, set the duplicate to gold, and then I'll take the duplicate and set it to inflate minus one so that it sits inside that skin mesh. And then that gives me this really nice ability to kind of be able to sculpt in and out of this gold material until I kind of have this uh, ratio that I'm looking for. So yeah, I also did a ton of uh, asymmetrical sculpting for this, which uh, really shook me awake because uh, I've had way too much reliance on ZBrush's symmetry over the years. <laughs> I'm sure you all can relate to that. But uh, yeah, some more raw looks. This is the final sculpture that uh, still is in my sculptural portfolio today, a couple years later. And then here's the final uh, concept render, and this is still in my concept art portfolio to this day as well. So yeah, this helped me set the pace for my concept art for the next year, two years really, and uh, opened up opportunities in film and television. And interestingly enough, this was the first piece that opened the door to digital fashion for me. Yeah, all industries that I'm very passionate about. <clears throat> So for fun, at the end of a project, I always do some creative renders, uh, like our version in pink had to do that. Uh, and on the far right, this is the uh, first render from my collab with the digital fashion house in London called Ouroboros. Uh, we sculpted a new flowing hair piece for her, and then soon she'll be wearing pieces from their upcoming digital fashion collection. And then last but not least, uh, yeah, please, for the love of God, have some fun with your art just for a second. Uh, yeah, my favorite part of concept, of course, is the uh, iterations, uh, which are incredibly fun to do once you've invested so much time into sculpting. Doing quick paintovers and renders at the end is like that cherry on top. 
Uh, obviously, I had to do a red version. I'm obsessed with the red palette at the moment. Did a silver ver version for Ouroboros, and then just a couple others uh, just to have some fun with it. But yeah, foundo foundational tools for a foundational portfolio, and yeah, obviously, alien goddesses are a staple in that. <laughs> So yeah, uh, this is how I've used ZBrush in my career. I'm incredibly fortunate, and I can't wait for the next decade of using this tool. Yeah, I hope I've given you all some ideas for your own paths forward as digital artists today. Uh, I know that if you work hard, dedicate yourself, you know, all the good stuff, and I know you guys know, uh, and approach learning in foundational ways, you too will be able to build pipelines that reach far into the future and ensure that you will be able to cre cre keep creating and designing for a very long time to come. Yeah, you guys are brilliant. Keep ZBrushing, keep creating. I promise you it's gonna pay off. Thank you all, appreciate it. Way to go, Xander Smith. <laughs> We have, um... Sorry, we got some demo going too, but uh, yeah, please feel free to always reach out to me. I'm on Instagram, um, at Xandersmith underscore design. I'm happy to share ideas and talk through any career artistic questions. Um, I'm also opening up a few slots in my mentorship program a bit later in the year, so reach out to me if that, for that if that's something that interests you. And uh, yeah, be sure to stop by for a one-on-one -on -one portfolio review today at 3.30, uh, yeah, if you wanna jump into that as well. I'm so glad you said that, because that continues outside. It's open to everybody, mm -hmm. portfolio reviews. Take advantage of that if you're here. Uh, it's, it's really important to do that. Um, hey, there's a couple questions coming in online, yeah, and please. we are now opening it up officially to questions from around the globe. The sculpts are gorgeous, says Modest NPC. Super appreciate that, thank you. Yeah, give it up one more time for Xander Smith. Seriously, thank you all. Thank Nezumi you. Nezumi wants to know, how many pieces would you consider enough for a portfolio? Man, one, if it's brilliant. <laughs> um, one brilliant piece gets you on the cover of the magazine. Absolutely. It's um, a true story. Man, that's a, uh, that's a tough question, because like, I've seen portfolios like 100 pieces, but if none of them jump out, you kind of get lost in the weeds kind of thing. Um, I think more typically when I'm hiring artists, um, I really kind of look at three foundational pieces that they share. I always ask for kind of more condensed portfolios. Um, I really just need to see like what you're great at and then just you know make sure that you're stepping on the gas of that in your portfolio. But yeah, uh, don't get lost in the weeds of like, I need to have a piece for every single industry, this or that, like pick what you wanna do, create a brilliant piece of work and start reaching out immediately. When you're reaching out to the studios, keep ZBrushing, you know, during the night and uh, build a portfolio that way. Okay, good. We got 15 minutes left, okay? 15, all right. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through a couple more here. Uh, let's see here, we've got, some people want me to tell you you have a great voice. <laughs> cool. Thank you. <laughs> One person up in here is talking about the voice of Keanu Reeves. Uh, I like it. Okay. Yes, give him a round of applause. Uh, yeah. Well done. Cheers Sanders for Smith. Keanu Reeves. <laughs> Cheers to Keanu Reeves. Um, I will take it. Yeah. Someone here is going to e be emailing you questions like crazy. All jokes aside, the, when is the perfect moment or when is a good moment to start polishing and detailing your models? Yeah. Um, Never, stick to the foundation. Um, no, very similar to uh, uh, the first presenter. I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting his name. Michael DeFail, yes, DeFail, Michael yeah. DeFail. Um, he really put a, a lot of emphasis on those uh, primary shapes to start. For me, I don't think we'll totally have time to get into it, but like every time I'm starting something, I start from like a six-sided cube. Like even for like a human head, everything starts uh, very, very simply. Um, and then to answer the question, only when you have a very, very solid grasp on your piece from that primitives, as in, if you were to cast light and render it, it still needs to read even before all the detailing. But once you have that, go nuts with the detailing. Yeah, Hopefully the principal that. foundation should be there. Absolutely, Or yeah. squint and look at it and say, oh, that looks good. Okay, anybody else in the live studio audience? Yes. Okay, so... You we like to do these personal projects, right? We Absolutely, work, work, always. work, but we, we explore a lot on these personal projects. I notice, like, for me, like, every five years, I kind of, like, stumble over something that I really like to do that I learned. Is there any th one or two things, like, in your fun time, in your exploration time, any one or two uh, techniques or things that, you, that stand out to you? that uh, you've learned recently in the last like couple years or so? 
Yeah, I mean, a lot for sure. Um, any like related to any specific industry or specific thing like that or just kind of generically? Well, let's just keep it generic. Uh, any kind of maybe a tool, a brush, a technique, a concept, a, a theory, a, you know, shape, form, anything that stands out? Yeah, man, I want to give you something cool for this. Uh, okay, I don't know if this is quite where you were thinking to go with this, but um, one thing I'm very interested in, I talked a little bit about it with like um, uh, uh, real-time animation, character animation and AR. Um, I was, uh, in 2019, I helped found a, uh, a tech startup in Los Angeles that was in the AI space, so long before all the boom right now. And uh, we were doing um, 3D sculpts of uh, 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 various characters, doing things that you couldn't do with practical makeup, and then training those on artificial intelligence uh, data sets um, so that we could do animation that way. And the second I saw ZBrush being used for real-time animation. You know, it was very primitive at the time, still fairly primitive, um, but I knew that that was gonna be absolutely earth-shattering, and uh, I definitely think that using ZBrush to ha you know, have complete control over your design, or in this case, your character, um, but for the purpose of a data set, I think is gonna be a very powerful workflow in the future. Uh, okay, one more online. Please. I want to become a 3D artist. Good, excellent. You're going to have a great time. <laughs> Should I learn and practice the fundamentals of art in 3D or 2D? Yeah, uh, that is a really good question. Um, so when I was a student, man, I was like a wiry 18-year-old, and uh, I was told, pick 2D or pick 3D. And I had a lot of great mentors. This is very solid advice that I did not take myself. I did both. And I seriously think that I'm kind of lacking in each. Like, neither one of them, I think, is, like, at that mastery state. That's very humble of you, but your models are wonderful. Thank you. Seriously, I appreciate that. You I can clap now. That's the part where you clap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, act, they're acting like it's, like, 7 o'clock in the evening. Can we try one more time? No, that... You... <laughs> Nearly 2 o'clock on the Pacific Standard Time. No, you guys have given me so much applause. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Thank you. This is like the most supportive community. Artists are very lovely people. Um, sorry, what was the question? One more time. <laughs> uh, 2D or 3D? Uh, basically, where, what, you know, how should they start off? Should yeah, they? absolutely. They want to so, be a 3D artist, though. Yeah, you, if you want to be a 3D artist, don't get me wrong. Learning 2D will give you like some very valuable insight, especially when it has to do with form and your visual interpretation of things. But how I might approach it now is like, if you want to be a 3D artist, spend 85, 90% of your time in 3D. That last 10% draw from life, because that's really going to teach you about form. You know, go to life uh, drawing uh, workshops, things like that. But yeah, go really hard on focusing on just the fundamentals of 3D, I would say. That's good. That's so good. balance it. Balance it. It's very important. You could also just go to a public place and stare at people, oddly. Which I do, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's a bit of a come on, but okay. Uh, let's see here. You've got about 10 minutes. Good deal. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, um, I'm very uh, happy to be able to share with you guys a uh, current collaboration that I'm working on with a digital fashion house here in Los Angeles. They're called Apparel Intelligence. They have an absolutely brilliant team. I wish I could talk more about the, uh, some of the projects they've taken on. Just the way they're thinking about fashion in the future is, like, ridiculously inspiring. Um, so... Yeah, I'm collaborating with them. I'm building them an avatar. Uh, one of the things I can talk about uh, that we're kind of in discussions of generically, this is also related to real-time animation and AR is, and experiential, um, is, uh, you know, imagine that you're at a, a fashion runway show and, you know, everyone has their phones out, you're watching that model walk down the runway. And uh, right now, we're very limited by what you can do with the human form, but once you get into AR, I mean, anything goes, right? So I very much love the idea of uh, being able to see models through AR in a way that they could never exist in the real world. Um, and so that's a bit of what we're exploring with our, uh, our avatar here that we're designing. So <laughs> what's cool about this piece too is this is like very much smack dab in the center of the workflow. So a lot of areas that are incomplete. 
or incomplete uh, with this piece and various uh, stages of finish. So, you know, one thing I want to make sure that I do as well is give this proper shout out to Apparel Intelligence. This is them. Definitely look them up. Um, yeah, just so you guys can kind of see what they're doing with, uh, with fabrics, with animation, with real time. This, is, uh, this piece right here is their Asteria dress, which is what I'm sculpting on top of today. Um, so yeah, just a very future, forward-facing forward uh, company. So this is Xandra. This is uh, their first avatar that we're working on. And <clears throat> basically, I know we only have a few minutes, so I want to make sure I can touch all of the... Thank you, very, very precise. Um, so yeah, basically, I'll run you through just how a workflow like this kind of comes together. So. For the garment, um, it's really cool that Marvelous is uh, supporting this event uh, because that is what we're exporting out of. So, you know, starting with those sketches uh, to try to figure out what it is, uh, what, they, what their team did uh, was go ahead and put together the first pass of the outfit, which we're seeing here uh, in Marvelous, and then we export that out uh, as a pose into ZBrush so we can start visualizing it immediately with the avatar. Um, so you can see, you know, very simple geometry going on here just as exports, but very, very friendly uh, to go back and forth between the two programs. Um, can export this out, this out as an FBX and get it right back into that T-pose and be ready straight for animation in it. So those two programs communicate with each other very nicely. And then for Xandra herself, um, so again, very similar to that alien god. Um, I'm kind of taking a design that we have a very strong foundation of. Uh, we went through a whole sketching process just to come up with her face and her uh, features, things like that. And then with the hair, we had literally no idea what we wanted to do. We did the most generic thing ever, and I hopped into ZBrush, turned off all my reference, and just started uh, sketching. And I have a few other versions here that I can kind of show like how I'm starting. So this is our very generic uh, rough. So you can see, this is literally just me starting with a plane. Uh, that I set along the top of the head and then basically just box modeling out until we have just uh, You know, this isn't even a full 3d shape It's just a plane all the way down until I can find a really nice silhouette to be working with and that gives me a really nice base to start sculpting into and We kind of you know, that's when we start bringing the reference boards together things like that once I have some uh, generic movements forward so once I was kind of playing with these uh, these are like reference from these, like I think they're like underwater sponges with kind of that undulation. Um, once we had that, then we started finding all this like underwater reference and uh, bioluminescent animals, things like that. Uh, so we started exploring with like, what could hair be that is not strand-based? Um, we didn't want to go uh, too far into say like X-Gen or something that's actually a strand-based system for hair. We want to stay sculptural. But obviously the challenge with sculptural hair is that it you know, can end up looking you know, cartoony or sculpture-like or something like that. So this is like very much in the middle of kind of uh, that concept art process that can always be shot back to them uh, so that they can be animating. Um, but just to kind of give you guys a look at you know, how kind of messy you can get just with your sculpture, but how that still can give you kind of that read uh, from a distance when you need. Um, yeah, a lot more things I could do with this. Uh, basically, on top of the uh, uh, base model that I have, I'm really just using that uh, fold brush in ZBrush. It's absolutely brilliant um, to bring out forms that you're affecting on both sides. And then just kind of going through process like this, um, obviously without my RGB on, uh, just to kind of get those undulations. And then for all of these secondary pieces, again, just to be able to exercise very tight control over the model. Each of these is just a very simple uh, uh, cylinder that's been stretched out and poly painted. For her bust, two, day, two ways to go about this. If you're a student, I highly recommend starting from a six-sided cube and subdivide your way up very slowly into all this. Get your forms down before you get into any tertiary dealing, uh, detailing. Um, but if you're a professional, um, CG, uh, uh, 3dscanstore.com, uh, they have a lot of these um, photo reel subdivision ready uh, heads that you can start working on. And that's what we used in the case of this. We got a commercial license for one of those heads. So that way you can start off with this like uh, very high fidelity detailing. Uh, and then from there, we can uh, always go back down to our very lowest subdivision level. And then just start pushing and pulling the forms out, uh, matching our concept, you know, doing everything in real time. 
Uh, you can see how simple I like to keep uh, all my topology along the way. Uh, the asset from 3D Scan Store definitely keeps us on track with that, but this is very doable starting from a box as well. <clears throat> and then once we have that, that way, this kind of answers that question before, uh, that's when you kind of stop in, uh, start going into that uh, tertiary detailing and then start like hand placing all the accents, things like that. Uh, once we had that going, this is so unfortunate too, I just realized my eyes are a bit messed up, but there we go, that looks better. Let's grab the other one. There we go, much better. Um, yeah, so forgot where I was at, but yeah, so once we have that, uh, then we can like start placing the eyeballs. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually just uh, hand sculpted those, uh, those irises. You can see just coming in here, uh, getting some photo reference in, and then just like basically just a standard brush, clay buildup, things like that, start getting that detailing going. Um, and then all of the quote unquote maps, you can really see it here in the eye, like how low fidelity they are. This is because um, one of the processes that I'm currently using uh, that I think is very effective, especially for concept art, is taking your 2D piece of concept art and just projecting it straight onto the 3D model. Um, there's like a little bit of touch up afterwards, you know, obviously then you uh, take your texture map. Uh, for me, I do some uh, touch up in Photoshop just to get it to sing a little bit more. Um, but uh, from just that projection alone, you can immediately start getting some character into it and start getting, you know, your art director happy. Um, same thing with, with the eyes, just projecting that model straight into it. You can see that's why they're still pretty rough, but effective. Um, and then the other thing uh, that we were really designing for with uh, this kind of future facing uh, way of thinking was this makeup effect here. So what we want to do ultimately is like have a filter in AR so that you can have this kind of animated makeup effect going across the face. And so for me, what I want to do was I'm kind of designing for that effect, but I want it to also be a part of the sculpt the sculpt itself so that it you know still has a sculptural feel to it and it's not just you know painted in or something like that. Um, but then also to, to, uh, to have something that's like well designed out and actually in 3D so that it can be passed to VFX and they can interpret that really nicely. So I'm still kind of in the process here trying to figure out like if the effect needs to go under her skin, above it, things like that. Um, but the kind of general idea being here is that combining that effect, making sure that effect is like solid as a sculptural piece on its own, just to kind of give you a a view of what that could look like, and just to kind of give a sense of like some movement as well, similar to the, the water base from uh, Defoe from our last presentation. Um, and then combining that with she has these uh, kind of galactic freckles going across the face, uh, as well as these kind of sculpted stars. And the uh, really cool idea here is that again, like duplicating uh, that mesh, setting in inflate to one, and then what we'll have is like lights um, that are actually inside each of these meshes. And you can see these uh, highlights to her eyes here are actually geometry themselves. Um, and then when we, once we get them into a render engine, they'll actually be casting light onto the model. It gives a really cool effect, especially when mixed with the bioluminescence. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's a bit of the process I'm using right now. You can see all the different directions we're gonna be able to take this. But uh, yeah, just having a ton of fun being able to not only sketch with ZBrush, but being assured that it's uh, also gonna be production ready. So yeah. Can I ask um, you a question? Absolutely, man. Anything, almost anything. Be careful. You know, you're, that was incredible. You, do you have a timer up there with you? Was that was that on the dot? <laughs> you were spot. He was spot on, right on the dot. It hit zero, and he was done. Give him a big round of applause. <laughs> come on, come on. Yeah. Thank you, thank you all. I just want to say, Xander Smith, what a nice joy it is to see you on the other side of the lights, giving a presentation. <laughs> Thumbs up. Thanks for doing that, and we really appreciate it, man. It was a great, uh, great deep dive into your process and oh, yeah. procedures that go into some of these things and a very diverse uh, collection of work. So really uh, online, it. I just want to draw your attention. You know, they're trolling all of you. They're saying it's very quiet this year. So let's, <laughs> let's, let's give them a reason to turn the volume down on their speakers one more time. Are you having a great time at the Zebra Summit 10th anniversary? A little louder. <laughs> Right, that's the type of thing that we're looking for. Okay, thank you so much. I, I think uh, at this particular point, we want to thank, again, uh, our sponsor, Marvelous Designer, today. We are going to be taking a break, and that'll give you a chance to go outside, rub elbows. Like I said, don't rub too hard. You might rip your jacket. Um, 
there are so many things happening outside that you can participate in. There's portfolio reviews that are open to the public. I would encourage you to do that. Don't forget there's a, there's a little handy dandy pamphlet that gives you a map and a breakdown of all the things that are happening on the entire grounds of the Noman School here in the shadow of the Hollywood sign. Uh, once again, I'm Louis Tucci. On behalf of the ZBrush team, we're so happy and elated to have you here for the 10th year anniversary.